Welcome in. The first things first, I'm Sarah Kustak filling in for Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. That's Nick Wright. Welcome back. Welcome Guys, back. Good how to was see the week off? Good to see you, brother. Off? Off. Sarah, it's wonderful thank you for to see you. In today. Nick looks nice and tan. Oh, you got thank a little you very color. Much. Chill. <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> I mean, he can use it. We, yes, he that, can use it. That is correct. Both of us went to the Caribbean, and we have a lot of fans in the Caribbean. People watching the show. I told you oh. when I went to Trinidad that that was true. You saw them Turks and Caicos. Yeah, but I thought they were just telling you stuff. I actually went there to do a survey, <laughs> and the people are watching. So thank you very much, and well, thanks for joining. I, I feel like I'm on vacation when I'm here. Oh, thank you, Sarah. This is Very my nice. vacation. That's a good little toss. That's a good. You're, you're, you're off to a blazing start. <laughs> That's what we want. We're going to start things off with the NBA as Kawhi Leonard has expressed his desire not to remain in San Antonio. According to reports, the Spurs will either keep Kawhi or deal him to a team in the Eastern Conference. This would go against Leonard's wishes as he reportedly wants to play in Los Angeles. CC, should the Spurs actually ignore all trade offers from Western Conference teams? Um, I don't think they should ignore him, but I, I, I think. For from a tactical standpoint, I think Kawhi and his team maybe made a mistake by just saying that I want to be traded, but I only want to be traded to, to L.A., that being the Lakers and the Clippers. Like if you want to be traded, you say where you want to be You want to be traded. And I think that was the important thing, saying where he was going to go, because to me, I've always had just a little bit of people telling me that they didn't think R.C. Buford and Greg Popovich, that they would trade Kawhi, not only trade him, but trade him to the Lakers. So I knew that would be a problem. So if Kawhi wants out, trying to have that type of restriction only makes it more difficult. And you reveal your total hand of what you want them to do because you really want to be moved. Now, Kawhi still has leverage. If they trade him somewhere in the East, Kawhi tells the team, I'm not going to sign a contract extension. Right. right. So he, he made it to where... If people believe the only place that you're getting him for more than one year is Los Angeles, then he made it to where the best offers the Spurs will get would be from one of the two Los Angeles teams. Now that the draft has passed, most likely the Lakers. The Clippers, when they sell those draft picks that weren't yet human beings, yes. they were just intangible mm -hmm. picks, then they could have made a package. But here's the thing, and I understand there's a real rivalry between the Spurs and the Lakers. I understand that these are the two, until Golden State came about for the last four years, these two teams dominated the conference for 20 years between the Spurs and the Lakers. You had 10 championships from between these teams from 99 up to right now. So I get it. But when you are have an opportunity that the Spurs have, which is one of the best trade assets to come about in recent NBA history, you have to take the best offer no matter who is offering it. Now, if the best offer comes from the East, that's a bonus, but I would not turn down any offer because of who's offering it if it's my best offer. Yeah, and I think that there, I think you bring up a great point about the 20 year, the rivalry, but if you look since Pop and R.C. Buford have been there, how did the Lakers get their best players? Through trade. Yes. So why would I help a franchise that is on a downward trend? Why would I help them resurrect their basketball future in giving them my best player? Now, I do believe that them demanding to go to the Lakers, that they could always try to get a better deal from another team in the East. But Pop saying that he was only going to coach for two more seasons. I believe he's a very, very responsible person, and he is not going to be the person to leave San Antonio in worse basketball shape by letting Kawhi go to the Lakers when he resigns and then having to watch them battle with the Lakers for championships into the future. Pop finally sat down with Kawhi this past week. If you are the Spurs, are, would you consider just keeping him? Are you in a rush to actually make a deal, or would you wait until until as far as the trade deadline or next it, what's your timeline? If line? it's as broken as Kawhi's camp has made it seem that it is as far as the relationship that whether it started with a misdiagnosis and then some anger about what was leaked what wasn't leaked some of the things that teammates said if it is so broken mm -hmm. that you are all but certain he's leaving then you have to trade him before the season starts because you have to get a legitimate return. Like, I want people to understand because he sat out a year. So I think people forget how good this guy is. The last time a top five player in his prime was available, you could argue was Kevin Garnett. You might argue it goes before that to Shaq when he went Lakers to Heat. This is similar to Barkley going to the Suns. This is much bigger than Kyrie Irving being available. A guy, a guy that's in that 
8 to 15 range comes available every couple, three years. Kawhi Leonard is 26 years old, a defensive player of the year, and a finals MVP. He's available. If if you can get him, it means one thing, but also means if you're trading him, you have to get a lion, a king's ransom for it. Yeah, and there's no system that he can't play in. People want to play up and down? Kawhi can play that. If you want to play half-court basketball, you can play that. He's self-motivated, and we know he's one of the best two-way players. So when you talk about how good Kawhi is, I mean, he can fit in any team, any um, organization. So for me, they have to be able to get a, a, a significant haul in trading him. Then despite knowing that his intentions are to play in Los Angeles, if you, though, are Philadelphia or you're Boston, do you think if we get him in our system, if we get him playing here accustomed with the market, we could convince him to want to stay here? I, the, I See, I'll let you go ahead on this. I, the, I have a theory, but go ahead. I, I think it's very, very difficult for Kawhi to get in his head. Now, I do believe that there's a part of Kawhi's team that would like him on the East Coast. They prefer New York. Like, he would prefer to be in Los Angeles or in New York. Now, I, I don't believe Boston, but when you can't go to Los Angeles and you're trying to get away from San Antonio, what are your options? If they trade him to the Boston, I'm sure that Danny Ainge and the Boston, um, the brass, they can convince Kawhi that this is the best place for him. So I believe it just now it gets more intriguing. I don't believe they're going to trade him to the Lakers, and I just believe that Philadelphia and Boston are viable spots for Kawhi. Listen, I if I think I can win a title this coming year, I absolutely would trade for Kawhi, believing I'll be able to keep him. And if I can't, maybe we win the title. Because here's the thing. Kawhi, Kawhi and his folks, I understand it, believe he wants to be in Los Angeles or New York. And he wants to be in Los Angeles or New York. But people also need to understand he's from Southern California. He went to college in Southern California. And then he gets drafted by the Spurs. If he spends a year in Philly, maybe he realizes, oh, every city that's not L.A. isn't San Antonio. You know, is that mm. the, the experience of, I can get the big city experience. I can get some right. of the exposure. I can get the lifestyle things L.A. offers, aside from the weather, in other places. And also, when he was doing the rehab and spent an extensive amount of time on the East Coast, you could, I could start to hear in Kauai in this camp that, you know, some of the East Coast is not so bad. And it is a viable option, but... That was communicated to me that that was New York City and playing for the Knicks. I just, go ahead. I was just going to say, should any teams be concerned about his health? Do you think, do you think that's a factor? Absolutely. I need to see him on the court. Yes. You can't, you can't take the things for granted that Nick is saying as far as his youth, being a two-way player, being one of the top five players. But I need to see him on the court. If, if he had been on the court, we wouldn't be talking about a trade. So, yes, I believe that's very important that I'm able to because I can't trade all those assets without knowing if he's able to play in 2018-19 season. And, and I just want to circle back to the idea of we don't want to trade him in the West for a moment. What the Spurs need to realize, and I think they do because they are run by such smart people, that is, with Popovich retiring in two years, with your best player absent of Kawhi being LaMarcus Aldridge, where your team got as basically played as well as it possibly could have this year without Kawhi, and they were drawing dead for a championship the entire time. If you trade him, it doesn't matter where he goes because the rest of his prime, you're not a contender yet. If you trade him, you are trading him so you are a contender in four years minimum. Because you have to have a top five player in this league to be a contender. So if you get Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram, for example, and one of those guys maybe one day is a top five player, that's four or five years down the road. So your windows and Kawhi's windows won't match up. If you trade Kawhi, you're no longer competing for championships in the short term. So it doesn't matter where he's competing for championships because that's not your real competition. Next week is going to be fascinating in the NBA because coming up, could LeBron actually stay in Cleveland? That's ahead on First Things First. At Buffalo Wild Wings, we'll admit that we often go overboard with our limited time offerings. We just can't help ourselves. Take our new signature sampler. For $15, you get wings and three shareable options like fried pickles or cheese curds. Then there's our aptly named over-the-top nachos, a literal mountain of crispy tortilla chips loaded with your choice of pulled pork or honey barbecue chicken, corn, jalapenos, and more. Then top it all off with our new platinum margarita. Go overboard with us today at Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings, beer, sports, 
Available for a limited time while supplies last. Please drink responsibly. On to the NFL. Buccaneers quarterback Jameis Winston is expected to be suspended several games by the NFL. It all stems from an incident in 2016 in which Winston allegedly sexually assaulted an Uber driver. Jameis denies this took place and has not been charged with any crime. CeCe, what was your reaction to this news? And typically, uh, stuff that, that happens... Um, you know, you might be just a little surprised about, but, you know, Jameis and tracking Jameis and knowing Jameis, I'm not, not surprised at all. I mean, I know a lot of players that played with Jameis at Florida State. Um, I, I know Jameis. have had several conversations with him. And to think when he came out of college, I had to ask myself this question yesterday when the news and everything came out. Did I ever think Jameis would go to the commissioner's office and visit with Roger Goodell before he left the NFL? And I said, yeah, of course he will. Like, so as a franchise quarterback, he's not a positional player. A positional player, if he happens to see the commissioner, okay, I can understand that. But franchise quarterbacks, they don't typically end in the commissioner's office. And given Jameis's past, it's, I think this will be a part of his legacy as a player. He is going to be a guy that is going to, you're going to question his judgment and it, this is not the only incident. At Florida State, there were several incidents. Some stuff reported, some stuff not reported. My daughter was at Florida State when Jameis was there and was very close to a lot of the guys on the football team. She went to high school with a bunch of guys on the football team, so that was kind of her inner circle. And he always stayed involved in things, so I'm not surprised. Um, I am disappointed that someone like Jameis, especially the things that he's already been exposed to, that he wouldn't be far more careful. And, I mean, these are serious, serious, serious. allegations. Here's, listen, I just wanted to let people know the timeline of this. When Jameis was at Florida State, he was accused of rape. Okay, so like if people, I understand people, it was weird his pre-draft process because since he was just accused and never charged or convicted, we lumped the rape accusation in with stole some crab legs and said something vulgar on a park, on a table. Yes. No, no, no. The, who cares about all the other stuff? There's one thing that mattered. He was accused of rape. And then in 2016, when this is alleged to have happened, he's in an Uber with a guy, Ronald Darby, and an unnamed associate. Well, we found out this week in the unnamed associate, this guy named Brandon Banks, who, when this allegedly happened, Brandon Banks was awaiting trial for rape. Brandon Banks is now unable to be interviewed by the NFL because he's in prison for rape. I don't know what James Winston did at Florida State. I know this, that if I'd been accused of a crime and I was very adamant that I was innocent of that crime, I would do my best not to hang out with people who had then just been accused of the exact same crime. And I have, I'm very open-minded when people get accused of something. I'm a big, I, I, if, you get, if you get accused of a crime, you'd want me on your jury. My burden of proof or reasonable doubt is high. Like I, the, but when you get accused of a similar thing two times, I get very concerned. And I think it's, I think anyone can be unjustly accused once. I think it's tough to convince me that two separate times unrelated people conspired to try to ruin your life. Because that's what an un inaccurate accusation of this would be. So when you talk about Jameis' legacy in the NFL, I, if this is true, I'm not sure how much longer he needs to play in the NFL. And a very good friend of mine I know is mentoring him in Derek Brooks. Now, you're not going to find a better mentor, Hall of Famer Derek Brooks, who played with Tampa Bay, has spent significant time with Jameis through the years, and all the reports that we were getting was, man, Jameis has made tremendous, tremendous strides on and off the field. Now, with this and the whole investigation, now, it's alleged. You know, he, he's not guilty, but it's, it's alleged. But for him to put himself, being a franchise quarterback, so for me, if I own the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I have to ask myself today, is Jameis Winston the quarterback of my future? Because the same question I asked myself when he was in college, would he ever be sit before the commissioner? You think that's still not on the board? And he's already been suspended once. So now what is the next suspension? So that part right there concerns me yeah, moving forward. Uh, number one overall pick in 2015, to your point, he has steadily progressed depending on how much or how long he gets suspended. How does this impact 
we'll get to the Buccaneers in their season, but just him, him in general, the decisions that they make for for what they want to do with it. Listen, I the I, I, my morality does not need to be everyone else's. I can only speak to my own, and I can get past a lot of things. I can if a player's talented enough. And he's a kleptomaniac. Man, I can, you, you're going to listen. Once every couple months, a guy's going to be picked up for stealing from Best Buy. All right, I'm going to deal with it. The guy, A guy that goes out and drinks too much and gets in bar fights, I can deal with it. Like, I'm much more lenient than my partner Chris is on a lot of this stuff. This is what, man, if, you, if, if, if you're the Bucks, and at the end of this investigation, you credibly believe he did this, I don't know why you'd want him on your football team. What he's accused of doing is awful. And you don't need to have a wife or a sister or a mother or a daughter to know it's awful. He's got to be a person to know it's awful. And I, I know what he was accused of at Florida State was horrific. I, I don't know that he did it. But I, I know a lot of people that go through their whole life with never being accused of any of this once. I don't know many people that go through their whole life of being unjustly accused of something like this twice. And that's so for me, like, what's his future? If he, if he did it, I don't think he should have much of a future. In, the, in this league, it, it's hard to commit the type of dollars that they would have to commit to him within the next year to year and a half. To me, that, that, that I couldn't justify that decision because I don't know where Jameis is mentally. I don't know what he's going to do, not only when he's on the field, but when he's off the field. And is he that kind of football player that I'm willing to walk this out with him the rest of the way and take that type of chance. And I'm just not that type of person. What, what about for Tampa? I mean, they open up at New Orleans. They've got Philadelphia. They, they've they, got Pittsburgh. D does this, how does this impact just how they start the season and what it may Well, it impacts how they the start. The if year. you look at the number of quarterbacks and good teams that we have in the NFC, forget about their division. Oh, Drew Brees. Oh, Cam Newton. They got their work, man. They got, they got their work cut out for them. But I believe that Ryan Fitzpatrick, in a situation like this, this is where he thrives. If you make him the starter for the whole season, oh, he's, he's, he's very, very average to pathetic. But you put him in a short stint, and you have all the OTAs in the summer camp to prepare him for that three games. So if they can come out of that, because they got high hopes in Tampa Bay this year, if they can come out of the three-game suspension, two and one, it will be a huge win for the Buccaneers. Well, and as, listen, if you are someone that likes to look at last year's schedule, last year's record to see how tough this year's schedule is, it's the toughest opening three games any team in the league has had in at least a decade. So, like, in playing there, playing three consecutive double-digit win teams. I mean, you mentioned them. It's, they're three of the best teams in the league that they, from last year. So, it's a tough stretch. You're right about Fitzpatrick, though. And this would be the 11th straight year Fitzpatrick started at least three games. Right? Three to six games. That's right. That's his absolute perfect zone for him. So, I think they could be okay. The bigger story, obviously, is what's happening with James. Yeah, all right. We'll continue to track that. And we've got more First Things First coming up after this. Catch baseball's biggest stars for an unforgettable show from the nation's capital, the MLB All-Star Game, July 17th, only on Fox, or you can stream it live on Fox Sports Go. Check us out, Sarah. We're there. Oh, you We're are? There. Broadcasting live oh, Monday and Tuesday. Derby. Yes. DC is going down. I like it. Back here on First Things First. And we're going viral. Alexi Lalas, who's going to join us on the show later, got fired up over this Brazil star Neymar being roughed up, including 10 fouls against him in the game against Switzerland alone. That's the most fouls against a single player in the World Cup in the last 20 years. And, of course, we can always count on the Internet to add to the jokes. Check this out. Twitter user Jean-Pierre oh, with the did. Neymar parody. Oh, I thought this that was, one here is great. Oh, I thought that was wait, Chris Tucker. Wait for it. Hold on. Wait for it. Go oh. eat that. Oh, you thought it was Chris Tucker? Yeah. <laughs> um, this And this, by the way, while the field is not nearly as nice, is a close, proximity, or close facsimile to what Switzerland did to Neymar. That was ridiculous in the opening game of the World Cup. Well, it's called the scouting report, Nick. You come into the World Cup banged up. Mm -hmm. You know, look at him with the pretty hair. He's a small guy. He's a pretty boy. You got to be able to rough See, him up. You got to be able to take the fight to him. And also, from a, from a tactical standpoint, you can't give Neymar any type of space. So you have to crowd him on the field. It just happened. We just had to See, get a little physical with See, him. I, uh, you cannot take your football philosophy 
hit them where they been <laughs> to soccer. You can't. It was very effective. It was. He was complaining the whole game. It was effective. It was against the rules. It was unsporting. There, there's not a sport that I've been involved in that you couldn't be physical. I just love the advantage. parody. I'd like to know how long that took. Time for some stories to start your morning. Let's start with the NBA. The Dallas Mavericks traded for Luka Doncic on draft night. Doncic was the MVP of the EuroLeague last season. Nick, do you like the selection the Mavs made? Hell yes, I like the selection selection the Mavs made. <laughs> I believe this is who they would have taken if they had got if they'd won the lottery. If they'd gotten the number 1 overall pick, they'd mm -hmm. have taken Luka Doncic. This is a 19-year-old who was the best player in the second best league in the world. Like I, I think he's the best player in this draft. I think they got a steal being able to get him with the fifth overall pick, essentially, plus their pick next year. I, I love this for Dallas. I don't know what Atlanta's doing. And, Nick, you love the fact that certain franchises do better with European players. In Dallas, look at Dirk Nowitzki and some of the other players. Besides San Antonio, who would you say that's done better with the talent of developing these players Great point. into spectacular players? Great job by Mark Cuban and Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, Rick Carlisle's going to have some fun with him. Okay, moving on, the guy he was traded for, Trey Young, who will be heading to Atlanta. Young led the NCAA in points and assists last season. CeCe, do you think Young will be a successful NBA player? I don't think so. I think it's marginalized because his inability to be able to finish at the rim. You know, we've seen three-point shooters come out of college, prolific, prolific scores come to the NBA, and people play up on them. People defensively, you know that they're going to struggle. Now, I do think it's better for him going to the Eastern Conference compared to the Western Conference where they are more top-heavy on the point guards. Here's the thing. I think we, we started talking about Trey Young so early in the season, and then you saw some flaws in this game. I think we've gone too far in the other direction. This guy, from an offensive standpoint, had the best freshman year of any player in college basketball since Kevin Durant. I, I wouldn't have traded Doncic for him, but I like Trey Young. I think he'll take a couple years. I think the Hawks are a good place for him. I think he will be a good NBA player. And to the NFL, Drew Brees is less than 1,500 yards away from Peyton Manning's record for career passing yards. And Peyton says Brees deserves the all-time record. CeCe, what does the all-time passing record mean for Drew Brees' legacy? If you, if you look in the era for which he played in, with some of the greatest throwers that we have, and, and maybe the best thrower in Aaron Rodgers, and to say that he holds the passing record. Oh, not Tom Brady? Not with Peyton. eight Super Bowl appearances? Oh, not Peyton Manning? It's Drew Brees, the underside kid from Purdue. Watch this pass right here. He has to jump to throw the ball down the middle, a 45-yard <laughs> strike. With all the impressive Brady, 6'5", um, Peyton Manning, 6'5 and a half, 6'6". Six, six. Man, Drew Brees, very impressed. One of the greatest throwers we've ever had. First ballot Hall of Famer. And he should get this record. Like, I know you're not big on the shoulds, but this is what Drew Brees' legacy is going to be. The guy, because he's not going to catch Brady in Super Bowls. He might not ever win another one. Like, they're a good team, but you have no idea. What Drew Brees, when I think of him in, he's a guy who's going to give you 300 yards passing basically every game he plays. How many 5,000 yes. yards? He has more 5,000-yard seasons, I believe, than everyone else in NFL history combined. combined. Yes. And so he should have this record. This will be in the first graph of his football resume. Finally, the Cowboys have faced a tough offseason, cutting Des Bryant and losing Jason Witten to retirement. However, Dak Prescott still has high hopes for Dallas' this season. Third-year quarterback said he is doing his absolute best to take the Cowboys to the Super Bowl. CC, what does Dak have to do next season for the Cowboys to be at their best? He's got to get better, sir, when they take away his first option. When the defense flashes on him and they have a certain receiver that they expect to get the football and he has to recollect and go to number two and number three. Those are things that Dak has not been very, very good at. And then also when Ezekiel Elliott was out and you say, Dallas, we can't run the ball. We need to rely on the passing attack. Can we throw the ball between 30 and 40 times and rely on our young quarterback? He wasn't very, very good at that. So in those situations, say Zeke's on the field and a team is doing a great job as far as stacking the box, taking them out of their run game, what does, that, what does Dak do in those situations? And if I take away your primary, what are you going to do? What adjustments are you going to make in year number three of getting to your third and fourth wide receiver? I, I want to build on one thing you said. Also, as you get into year three, he's not quite a veteran yet, but he's not a rookie anymore. 
How much does his ball do what you've talked a lot about, which is speak to his receivers? <laughs> the Cowboys were bottom of the league in yards after catch last year. Now, part of that's because their wide receivers weren't very explosive, right? Part of that's mm -hmm. on the receivers. But part of that's also when Dak is delivering the ball, is he delivering it in the right place, not just for the catch, but to be productive after the catch. If you have open space, is he leading you? Like, those, those are the smaller things that I think he can do. But bigger picture-wise, see, what I... You got to do one of two things if you're going to be a top flight quarterback in this league. You've got to either, and the, the best, do both. Take care of the football at a very high rate or create explosive plays. His rookie year, he did the former. He took care of the football at a historic rate. Four interceptions all season. Mm -hmm. He wasn't fumbling the football. He wasn't great on the explosive plays. But it didn't matter because he, he wasn't creating any extra possessions for the other team. Last year, he did neither great. He turned the ball over, still yep. didn't have the explosive play. So either he's got to get back to the ball security of his rookie year or he's got to add the aspect of big plays his third year. Yeah, one thing coaches talk about, uh, Sarah, is when you're a quarterback, how many times does the opposition touch the football? That means batted passes or deflected passes by the defenders because you know eventually those turn into turnovers. Tip passes turn into interceptions, deflected passes, they, de um, they stop you from converting third down and stop drive. So every time a defender touches the ball, and you see that with Dak an awful lot, how do you eliminate those touch balls? When you watch the video, watch how many times defenders, either at the line of scrimmage or down the field, that they actually get their hand on the football. You mentioned Ezekiel Elliott will be back now this season with him, but does he... In, in terms of weapons, in terms of receivers, not having a true number one option, does he have enough weapons in the receiving core? No, not to be dynamic, not to match the type of running game that they have. They have, of their receiving core, they have 1,000-yard season of all the wide receivers and tight ends. Combined. So, I mean, where do the explosive plays come from? Because, yes, you can be methodical in this NFL, but eventually – you have to get big chunk yards. You have to get plays between 15 and more yards in the passing game. And how do they come up with those? Like, those are yet to be – they don't have a number one receiver. They have guys that are used to being number two, number three, and number four if I was being nice. And listen, the, and because of that, you're not going to have as many – enormous plays, right? You're not Because you don't have a number one receiver, you're not going to have as many 35-yard plays on first and 10. They're, the Cowboys are going to have long drives. They need to have long drives to be successful. Mm -hmm. Zeke's going to take care of your third and less than four. So where Dak needs to be near the top of the league, how good can he be the time Zeke gets stopped on second down and they're in third and nine? Can he continue those drives, get you a new set of downs so Zeke can then take over again? And every replacement, regardless of what they think, Sarah, you know this being an athlete, everyone thinks they're better than what they are. So you know what, man, if I'm not a shooting guard, man, I want to be able to shoot the ball. If I'm not a point guard, I want to be able to dribble. I can make plays. But as a wide receiver, we all think. If I'm a four, I'm a three. If I'm really a three, I'm really a two. And if I'm a number two, I'm a number one. Everyone's not a number one replacement like yourself. Jenna's out, Sarah's in, a number one replacement. <laughs> Dallas does not have that. Well, we're going to talk about the number one guy back at the NBA. And while the two favorites to sign LeBron James seem to be Cleveland or L.A., Philadelphia is attempting to enter the LeBron James sweepstakes. The 76ers reportedly doing everything they can to clear cap space for James to sign there. LeBron has until Friday to sign or decline his player option for next year. Nick, is there a chance that LeBron actually stays in Cleveland? So I'm going to say something that might surprise some of the viewers if you watch the show regularly. Because for months now, I've been saying LeBron's gone. Like, this was your chance yes. that I... Going into the year, I said the only way he stays is if they win the title. <laughs> Two months ago, I said, even if they win the title, LeBron's gone. I, well, I didn't do much work in our week off. The little bit I did was trying to talk to some people about this because I know this is the big sports story of the next month. And I was told do not slam the door shut on LeBron staying in Cleveland. I, I wasn't told it's likely. I wasn't told they're the favorite. But I was told... You're, They're back in the picture. You, and you shouldn't go on TV and say it's 0%. Basically, it's exactly mm -hmm. what I was told. Don't call it 0%. Because the point you've been making, see, and I'll let you elaborate on it, the family thing is real. And the point the general public's been making, which is, is there a perfect fit? Is there a fit that you're like, oh, bingo, mm -hmm. that's it? Right. right. That doesn't seem to be there. And so 
I would. I does he could he stay in Cleveland? Yes. Would he sign a long-term deal in Cleveland? I do not believe that is possible. I think if he does, we're doing all this again in a year. But I now, for the first time in months, think it's a real possibility that he does stay. And we just we just miss on the fact that because he's from Ohio, you know, we got Kawhi, he's from California. We got Paul George, he's from California. Now, these guys trying to get back to California. That's what LeBron did, his second decision. He, he left Miami. He left the glitz and the glamour, a couple NBA championships to say, look at his ladder. I'm going back home because Northeast Ohio means that much. Now, Urban Meyer and I talk about this all the time. We talk to recruits and everything. We talk about, you're going to make a four-year decision or you're going to make a 40-year decision? Because I'm approaching, that's how long I've been gone from Ohio and Ohio State. But, Nick, you've been there with me. It's like yesterday. And the way they treat their athletes, LeBron, we see him at Ohio State football games. He's always said, if I went to college, I would go to Ohio State. I would have went to Ohio State because the pool from Ohio, him and his wife are from Ohio. All right. His business partner, Maverick, Maverick from Ohio, he's from Ohio, Rich Paul. And this is this is all that they know. They can get to L.A at some other point in their life or in the offseason. And I just believe the decision is not only LeBron in basketball. His wife has a lot to do with the decision and those boys, and those boys. who want to play basketball. And you typically who they want to play basketball with? With people they know. Well, and you can expand on that. And, CC, I know you've brought this up. His sons are now at a different age. Back when he was making his decision to go They weren't a part of the decision. They didn't have a speaking role, yes. as you would put it. And now, now they do. Bronnie. Particularly Bronnie. Mm -hmm. And and I, I know we, we try to be careful on the show and talk about the kid too much because he's 13 years old. Don't want to put added pressure on him. But this, this kid is beginning to build a profile of his own amongst the recruitment circuit, right? Amongst college basketball, the, 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 the people that rate young people. And he's doing it in with his Ohio team. You know what I mean? With his summer league team. And so, like, that that matters at least to a degree. I, I can't, though, have this discussion without going back a year ago this time, or 11 months ago, and the Kyrie trade. And I say that because of this. What are we now hearing about Paul George? Paul George might stay in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And Paul George, you can be a free agent, go to L.A., might stay in Oklahoma City. If you remember, the Cavs could have had Paul George. The Cavs, LeBron didn't want them to trade Kyrie, but whatever, they, they chose to trade Kyrie. They decided they didn't want Paul George because they didn't want a rental. They wouldn't be able to keep him. They wanted that super valuable Philly or Brooklyn pick that became the eighth pick, and Colin Sexton might have been good. And actually, what what the Cavs offered the Pacers was better than what the Pacers accepted in the trade for Paul. Well, what they were initially discussing with it, but then Dan Gilbert wanted that pick. They wanted a post-LeBron future. If LeBron is considering, and I can tell you, he is at least considering staying in Cleveland now with this team. What would it be like if Paul George was on the team? If Paul George considering staying with Ross, he'd be saying, yeah. like, and they'd so, be talking about adding a third piece. Well, so exactly with that being right. said, there's a reason you have said zero percent. We saw throughout the course of the season, we saw in the postseason the frustration of LeBron. So you can't change the past. What can the Cavs do now to potentially try and persuade him if he were? Well, I believe that I, I believe that the hold of Ohio is real to LeBron in his camp, but also the fact: how do they get better? Can they go out and get Kimba? Can they get him from, from Charlotte? That wouldn't, because they got to get better at the guard position. You cannot go back into the 2018 19 season with George Hill and J.R. Smith. And Jordan and, Clarkson. I mean, like, you cannot. I was going to get to him later. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you just cannot do it. Your backcourt's got to get stronger, and you think you've done that through the draft, but they still need to make an additional move. And this is just, and the. And they, they obviously don't have the cap space to make the move. Mm -hmm. The only – they have two valuable assets outside of LeBron. One is Colin Sexton, but that was more valuable as the eighth pick than is Colin Sexton. Because the eighth pick, when you trade him, it's whomever they want. Now it's a human being. It's you have to like right. that player. You have to need a point guard. And the other potential assets, Kevin Love. Kevin Love's only valuable on a very specific set of teams. You can't be trying to beat the Warriors. You have to basically be out east. You've got to be a team that, you know, who who looks at Kevin Love and says, I guess maybe the Suns. 
Like, could the Suns say, all right, we're, we're, we're not trying to compete for a championship, but we don't have our pick next year. Like, we just want to eke into the playoffs as the eighth seed. Like, so they don't have a lot of great ways to improve that basketball team. Kimball Walker, mm -hmm. though, yeah, if the, if the Hornets want Sexton for Walker and Filler, that makes it a little more attractive for LeBron, I'm sure. It'll be interesting to see. All right, coming up, can Eli Manning lead the Giants to a bounce-back season? That's next on First Things First. Welcome back. First things first, we're now joined by former NFL head coach Good Eric Mancini. Good to are be you? back. Good to be here. Have you been on vacation or no? Uh, Just these two? A little bit. Uh, in Cape Cod, we spent some time oh. there. So, yeah. Oh. You can't tell when my Schooning. golden bronze <laughs> I've, I've learned not, <laughs> not to talk about bronze anyone's bronze. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss the New York Giants. We're going to get to some stuff that we do know. Despite a disappointing 2017 season, Eli Manning has high hopes for 2018. He, of course, will get his best receiver back in Odell Beckham this season, along with number two overall pick Saquon Barkley. He believes the Giants offense will lead them to a bounce back year. It's been an unbelievable, unbelievable run, I got, but I want to continue doing it. It's not over. I know that, and uh, I, love, I love playing quarterback. I love everything that goes into it, and uh, you know, excited for this upcoming year and you know, to prove that, hey, I can still play at a high level. We can win games. We can win championships, and it is about a game. It is about working to try to get better, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. Coach, how much do the Giants need? He mentions winning championships. How much do the Giants need from Eli Manning this season? Well, with the pieces that they've given him and, and the pieces that are coming back, getting Odell back and, and the threat that that's going to create in the passing game, then you add Saquon Barkley and, and the, the issues he's going to create, this should open up a lot of things for Eli. And, and the addition of Nate Soldier and to handle that left tackle position, mm -hmm. Will Hernandez, they've, they've made some other improvements to the offensive line. They've put a lot of pieces in place to allow him to be successful. And I thought he took too much criticism for the failure they had last year thought he played better than people gave him credit for. And, and him saying that they can win championships, I don't think that's beyond uh, the range of possibilities at all. I think, I think they can be in the mix sooner rather than later if they keep making strides. I'm with Coach. I also, I'll throw out last season because they had a rash of injuries that we don't see teams recover from and the time for which they happen. Immediate, early in the season. So I look for them to have a bounce back here. I like the pieces that they've put around Eli. Can the Giants win another championship? I think it's going to be hard for them with all the quarterbacks that we have, all the teams that they would have to go through. Now, I do believe that they can, they can get to nine wins and be a playoff team and go in the wild card route, which they have successfully done that in getting to the Super Bowl. But their defense is what we should be talking about. I know that we got the sexy conversation with Eli, offensive tackle. He got the, the draft pick, Hernandez. Yeah, okay, Odell Beckham. But that defense, can they play New York Giants? Because we have never seen the Giants win a Super Bowl without their defense being a dominant defense. So it's nice to talk about Eli. It's nice to talk about the new offense coordinator, new head coach who's the offensive coordinator. Yes, but it really relies on that defense. They got a lot of players playing on that defense who make a lot of money, Sarah. Will they play up to the way they did in 2016 where they would play in a championship form if they are able to do that and create turnovers? Pressure on the quarterback and turnovers. I believe Eli and the rest of that offense and Giants team, yes, they can get back and make a march to a Super Bowl. And, and with that defense, too, it, they've got to put Eli in a position to be successful. He can't be playing from behind every single game. That, that's not where, where they're going to be able to operate and operate effectively. But if they can, they can have a balanced attack through four quarters, to me, that's where Eli is, is most effective. Uh, let's assume just for the moment, for the sake of argument, the defense is good. Doesn't have to be as great as it was. I don't know if it's great, but very, very good in 2016. Yeah, but, but they're a top 10 defense. Top 10 defense. That's a perfect way to put it. Healthier. Landon Collins playing better. They don't have the mutiny that was going on in the defensive backfield. Maybe. Yes. So let's just say the defense is good. Odell is there. Saquon is what we think Saquon's going to be, at least the, to, to that level. That Eli is positioned well, okay? I, the question I have about the Giants is about the quarterback. Because the question I have is, if I am listing just pros and cons for a team, which column at this point in his career is having Eli Manning as your quarterback? At this point in his career. It's not about the two Super Bowls. It's not about what he's accomplished. Right now, in that conference... Is he an above-average quarterback? Is he better than eight quarterbacks in the NFC? I tried to find him. I, I don't know if I can. 
So, like, it, it, right now, is Eli Manning, does, is he a force multiplier anymore? I say no. Is he good enough, if everything around him is perfect, to get you to a championship? Maybe. Like, I don't, and that's not an indictment on what he's accomplished, but it is a reality, I think, about who he might be at this right. point. I don't think you're looking at the two teams he took the Super Bowl, because those weren't great dominant teams. The first Super Bowl they went to, they went on a run late in the season to barely get into the playoffs. And the way he played football was like any of the other top quarterbacks. When we've seen Eli, and he's had a competent team. So I believe Eli, like you, Coach, gets too much blame. And what happened last year was not Eli's fault. I believe that also Evan Ingram, the tight end, I believe he's going to be a superstar. I believe you like him, but in this day and age in the NFL where mismatches and guys putting them in space, I believe he will be a tremendous asset. I believe all the pressure is not on Eli, and I believe he's more than competent. If they had drafted a quarterback, we wouldn't be saying, are they a Super Bowl contender? All right, we'll be talking about the rebuilding stage of the New York football Giants. So I'm glad that they went back with Eli, went with Nate Solder on the left tackle, and, desi and decided to draft Barkley with the running back. Coach, uh, with CC saying, do you think the decision to draft Barkley was more about the confidence in Eli in, in keeping him at quarterback or what they believe Saquon Barkley will be? Yeah, I, I think they went in and, and the GM, the head coach, sat down and watched, was able to sit back and really study him throughout the course of the season and realized they still had a very good quarterback. And I disagree, Nick. I don't think he's at the point where he's any any sort of liability. I do think he's a force multiplier. I think that oh. he is I think he's a, a, a smart player. I don't think he gets enough credit for the success that they had. We talk about great quarterbacks all the time that haven't won a second Super Bowl. He did that, and he did that with teams that you wouldn't sit back and say, Oh my God, that, that was a an, an incredible group of, we, of we started of those seasons with the same type of questions that we start this season with, and they uh, end up getting too Lombardi. I, listen, I, and which is why I tried to be very clear. I am not disparaging what the man's accomplished, but that last Super Bowl was 2011. We have seven years since then. We have one year where he was the worst quarterback in football, the year before they got Odell. Period, point blank, the worst quarterback in football. I mean, I, the, I, I mean, we can go through those quarterbacks. We can go through the, 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 worst, the worst starting quarterback, not, not backup that got pressed into duty. He had a 69 passer rating through 27 picks to 18 touchdowns. That was for a season. They got Odell. He got a little bit better. But we are now, I don't think, you know who also won two Super Bowls? And it was all great. His brother. His brother right now would not be a force multiplier. His brother right now, like, Eli, to me, is closer to the end than the beginning. I think we all know that. And closer to a guy that is, at this point in his career, a, a caretaker quarterback than he was the guy in 2011. 2011 was his athletic prime. This is the thing. Eli's athletic, it will never change. His body, his arm talent, it has not changed since his rookie year. He does not have the type of physical skills that deteriorate. He's not running with the football, and Eli has plenty enough arm strength. I worked out with Peyton and Eli on the same field, and Eli has a much stronger arm than Peyton would ever have. But, man, you need help around you. If you can't see if you don't have any brass protection, you got an incompetent defense and all the other things. You also got the kid with blonde hair out there acting a fool every once in a while. So Eli has overcome tremendous distractions to be able to win those two Super Bowls. And, and looking at his athletic ability is kind of looking at Tom, like uh, Tom Brady's I don't athletic ability. I said ability. his athletic ability. W I said his said prime. His... I said by athlete. I meant prime for an athlete. His prime for an athlete. What about look at our quarterbacks but, now? Look at Philip Rivers. Look at Tom Brady. Look at Drew Brees. All these guys. Eli and, hadn't been and, hurt, and, just like them. I also think those guys have always been better passers than Eli. And don't, don't you think prime is being redefined by guys like Tom Brady? Absolutely. Th th there's a new prime here, and, and the experience that you have, the ability to control the offense, the ability to understand mm -hmm. what you're getting With defensively. With the quick passing game. Yeah, those those things are, are, are underrated. You, you see a ton of talented, athletic gifted players who can never play quarterback at a high level because they can't figure out what's happening in front of them. He can, and he can do it do it really well. Okay. Coach, we're bringing you back later. Good. We want to hear more. Nope. <laughs> I, I, up. I think you guys are going to be holding that. Nope. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's next. Yes, That's next. Thing. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.
Welcome back to First Things First. Chris Broussard now joins the show. Chris, right, thanks for being here with us. Always. I know. I feel like it's I've been to in L.A. too long. Yeah. Oh, it's good not to be stop. You, you buckled in, ready for all this oh. free agency. <laughs> good to see you. All right, let's talk about Kawhi Leonard, who has expressed his desire not to remain in San Antonio. According to reports, the Spurs will either keep Kawhi or deal him to a team in the Eastern Conference. This would go against Leonard's wishes, as he reportedly wants to play in Los Angeles. Chris, should the Spurs actually ignore? all trade offers from Western Conference teams? I think for now, they should. I think, you know, th their tact is they want to try to mend fences. They don't have to be in a rush. I mean, technically, you've really got until February to pull the trigger on a trade. I don't know if you want to wait that at long. At the trade deadline. Yeah, at the okay. deadline. Mm -hmm. But right now, why rush into a deal with a Western Conference team or any team Try to mend the fence. Now, I'm told that's going to be virtually impossible to do. Mm -hmm. You know, Kawhi is ready to move on. The problem is not so much Greg Popovich. He still has great respect for Pop. But the front office, the way they handled him, the misdiagnosis. But beyond that, he felt like we were all on board together. You guys were in agreement with me going to New York. You sent your trainers out there to work mm -hmm. out with me. And when the press, the media went off on Kawhi because he wasn't on the bench during the playoffs. The Spurs never stepped they up to say, him. hey, we knew he was going to New York. We're, 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 we're all on the same page. He felt like they left him to hang out to dry. And so he's L.A. or bust. Not so much Lakers or bust. They're the first choice. But he's mm -hmm. L.A. or bust. So I think, though, right now, try them in the fences. If that doesn't work, then see what the Eastern Conference team will offer. Are you concerned, though, because Kawhi is a little bit different yeah. as, as far as, you know, what he really wants. A lot of people don't know. They don't know Kawhi. There's not a lot of people that are really, really close to him. Do you think Kawhi can be talked back in to San Antonio? From what I'm being told, no. Okay. I'd say no. Which is amazing. But I would try if I'm them. Right? But it, it speaks to what has happened in that relationship. Because that is a 70 plus million dollar decision. So the Spurs can offer him so much more money than everybody else, and they will. Like, they, they will, they, they will yep, eat that the and give him the Supermax. Five years, $219 million. And that's a deal that if he doesn't take it this offseason, he, if he doesn't, let's say he just plays out the deal, right? Spurs. He has to re-qualify for it. Yep. He's no longer eligible for it after this offseason. Yeah, so there's a formula. There's right. certain things he has to All NBA or MVP, yes. defense player there, something like that. Here's, here's the thing if you're San Antonio and you can't mend it and you do realize you are going to trade him. I, am, I do not care what conference I trade him to. Kawhi Leonard will be, if he's traded, the best player traded since Shaquille O'Neal was traded to the Miami Heat. Period, point blank. Kawhi Leonard is better than Dwight. Yeah, I'm like He's better than. Trade, yeah, no, I'm not counting LeBron yeah, going yeah, to Miami, yeah. which was a free agency thing. The best player traded in this league in almost 15 years. If Kawhi Leonard is traded, if you're the, if you are the person giving that player up, you have to simply take the best available offer. You cannot say, well, uh, it's not as good of an offer as LA, but at least he goes out east. If you are the team giving up the best player traded in 15 years in this league. You have to trade him to whomever's giving you the best return. I do agree, and I think at the end of the day, you get to that point. Because I've talked to GMs who are insistent. You don't trade them to your conference. However, at the end of the day, you do what makes your team best. And But right now, I wouldn't go there. Right now, see if an Eastern team will offer more in hopes of winning the title, Boston or Philly, mm -hmm. and then convincing him to stay. Cleveland, we, I heard you guys talking earlier. If LeBron decides to stay for one year, because he doesn't have to become a free agent, right. right? Stay for one year. If I'm Cleveland, I'm going for Kawhi. And that I don't know that San Antonio wants Kevin Love because they got LaMarcus Aldridge. Mm -hmm. But I'd offer Kevin Love, Colin Sexton. Sexton. And maybe you can do a three-way where a team that does want Kevin Love. So you get Kawhi and LeBron for one year. And you go for it. You know both of them will probably leave, maybe even go to L.A. together in 2019. But those are options out there. And then if I can't get something I like, look, I'll take Brandon Ingram, Kyle Kuzma, and uh, maybe if you but, want Lonzo Ball. But you do that on the back end. Exactly. You, you, I, I'd you. explore everything else first. Well, who has the leverage then? I, I mean, you are talking about an elite player. Nick laid out the elite type of player Kawhi is, but the Spurs are in no rush. If you're an Eastern Conference team, 
if you're Philadelphia, if you're Boston, do you believe you can convince him to stay if you get him there for a year? Or is there taking that risk because you know at the end of one year he could I be wouldn't gone? do it if I was Philadelphia because I don't think he's going to stay. Now, if he wins a championship, that's hard to walk away from. But I think at wherever he is traded, if he's traded to the East, I think his plan will be when I'm a free agent in 2019, I'm walking. Now, here's the Spurs' one leverage is this. Let's say they don't trade Kawhi and LeBron and Paul George go to the Lakers. The Lakers' cap room is used up. Now, the Clippers would have cap room next summer. They'll have plenty, so they'll be a player. But you could at least eliminate the Lakers from the, the scenario if you wait, wait it out. The other, the, listen, but the other problem with Kawhi making it so clear he only wants to go to L.A., the, and then the Spurs reportedly saying we only want to trade him to the East, is the teams in the East are going to give you a worse package. Yeah. Because they, they don't think he's going to stay. Like, you're, if, if, if you thought you were trading for Kawhi Leonard, and when you traded for him, he was signing an extension, what is what does Boston not put on the table other than Jason Tatum? Nothing. What does Philly not put on the table other than Simmons and Embiid? Nothing. Like, if you think we're going to fight for five years. But they would know that years, regard. You're saying so the Spurs shouldn't have came out and said we're only dealing with the No, East. no, no. What I'm saying is Kawhi le- making it clear he wants L.A. weakens what teams from the East will offer, which further goes to the point that I'm trying to make, which is the Spurs yeah, can't eliminate him. He doesn't care. No, 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 Kawhi doesn't but, care about that. No, no, He's no, like, I, I don't think, care what they offer. I don't want to play there. No, no. I don't think – I don't agree with you as far as the trade with the East. Like, Danny right. Ainge, just because – San Antonio said we're only going to trade them to the East. That doesn't mean Danny Ainge and them are going to give them, well, you know, we'll give them our second or third best offer. No. Because in that East, Philadelphia could be also getting better. So yes. why wouldn't you still make your best offer if you're trying to land the prospect? Okay, I, I, don't, I don't have that same thinking. The, the, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to make this clear. I don't think the Spurs comments make the Celtics or Sixers give a worse offer. I think Kawhi's reportedly wanting, only going to sign an extension in L.A. That makes them give the worst offer. Okay. Right, because they don't think they're going to be able to keep him long term. We got a lot more to discuss. We're bringing you back, uh, but Chris, um, we're going to take a break because we're going to talk to Alexi Lalas. He's going to join us live from, from Moscow. Moscow. Plug. We got a very special guest now, joined by Fox soccer analyst Alexi Lalas, live from Moscow. Alexi, thanks for joining us. Hey, Privet Majulja, how are we doing? All right, everybody good? I'm We're pumped. good. This is, I'm pumped up, man. I am pumped up. <laughs> this is exactly, exactly what we want to hear. We're going to start off with the late game that's on Fox. Cristiano Ronaldo in Portugal taking on Iran. How impressed have you been with his play so far? Well, look, uh, you want stars to star, uh, regardless of what sport or what tournament we're talking about. And he came out of the box flying uh, with a hat trick against Spain, uh, and then followed it up with another goal. So this guy is on fire. Uh, unlike some other uh, stars here, he came out, he brought it both of these two games. Uh, I would look for him to continue that today. Uh, he is being everything that we ask of the star, not necessarily taking over games, but ultimately when you talk about Cristiano Ronaldo, it's about scoring goals. And that is what he's doing. And not just goals, some wonderful goals so it's fun to see when the stars show up at a world cup uh, we'll see if that trend continues with him and maybe uh, reverses with some other ones uh, alexis that's nice you took a couple little shots at some of the other stars who aren't playing <laughs> up to their ability is he a big enough star and is he good enough to be able to take them all the way I don't think so. Uh, he is a big enough star. I mean, you can't get much bigger. But uh, as far as shouldering the load, uh, it, it's still early days here at the World Cup, and a lot can happen. And the soccer gods sometimes smile upon you, and sometimes they curse you, sometimes within the same tournament. So uh, when I look at this Portugal team, keep in mind that this is the defending European champions. So it's not as if it's just some mediocre team. This is a good team. It's not a great team. And they are certainly going to face much stiffer competition as this tournament goes on. And at some point, Cristiano is going to be shut down. And as is the case a lot of time when you have a big star, can the others pick up the slack? And I think uh, that there is a big disparity when it comes to Cristiano and the others. Uh, we will see. Uh, I, I, I would love to see what this team looks like when it gets into the round of 16 and how dependent it is on Cristiano. But, man, if you're going to ride a player, this is the guy to ride. All right, Alexi, you know who I'm pulling for. I'm pulling for Mexico, El Tri. They're 2-0, and which typically is great, right? Like, I think going into this World Cup, 91 of 92 teams that have won two games in their group have advanced. Only one team hasn't. But I'm looking at the scenarios. 
Mexico's a far from a lock right now, right? Like, they could still be left out if they don't win this upcoming, if they lose this upcoming game against Sweden. What do you, what do you think of their play so far, and what can you tell the fans who are rooting for Mexico about their chances of advancing? Well, as far as their play so far, it's been wonderful. I think it's been everything that you would have wished for. Uh, you've got incredible individual performances uh, from Irving Chucky Lozano, who has just been wonderful. And in this in this store uh, in this storefront window that is the World Cup, I just think his stock is going up and up, and his value, by the way, and oh, to be his agent. Uh, you got Chicharito scoring goals. You got Carlos Vela from LAFC with that silky smooth left foot of his. Uh, and you got a belief. And you started off the tournament beating the defending champs. And yet, as you mentioned. After two games uh, and two wins in a row, they're still faced with a, a game where they need to get something out uh, out of this game, th this third game. And would it be inc would it be strange? Yes. Uh, is it is it uh, something that can't happen? No. But Mexico has to see this through now in this third game. But I think that they're flying right now in terms of their confidence. Uh, they have turned a lot of heads, not just to people like uh, ourselves that know uh, know our friends from the south, but a lot of people around the world are looking at this team as something to watch because of the individual brilliance and the collective excitement and entertainment they bring. But the work is not done for them in the group stage. So that third game is going to be huge. Alexi, I've got Nick trying to sell me on Mexico, CC trying to sell me on Senegal. So I need an unbiased opinion. Through the first two rounds of group play, who's been the most impressive team in the World Cup? Okay, I think uh, your safe bet is Belgium. And, and it's not that this was a, a dark horse that nobody could see coming. This has been a almost a perpetual uh, le uh, legendary group of talent that have yet to fulfill their potential. And yet the first two games, uh, Romelu Luk Lukaku has been wonderful scoring goals, Eden Hazard. I think that's a safe bet uh, right now as to a team that could, go, that could go far. And certainly based off the first couple of games, that is the case. They're, they're already through to the uh, round of 16 uh, right now. I think an interesting one, and, and it's, not, it's not a second, name, but Croatia right now has really turned a lot of heads, uh, and I think a lot of people will be looking at Croatia as a possible uh, team to go for. France still is just kind of cruising along and, and being French, if you will, uh, in that they're <laughs> impressive, they're kind of they're, they're good-looking in the way that they play, but they, they flatter to deceive at different points, but if they get it together, that would be a, a wonderful thing. Uh, one thing that, to, to keep in mind here is Argentina. We haven't hit upon Messi yet. Uh, don't count them out. Uh, this has been an absolute disaster on and off the field for Argentina so far. And yet they still sit in this moment with a possibility of going into the round of 16. Uh, the inner tur turmoil between coaches and players, between players and players, between, uh, between the, the, the team and the fans, uh, between the team and the media is, is wonderful drama. And for us, it's, it's manna from heaven. I mean, because it gives us content every single day. Sad, messy. By the way, this World Cup also, everybody's crying. From the moment we started this World Cup, everyone is crying. All right, you got you got Neymar crying, you got players crying, you got coaches crying, you got m members of the media. I came on air crying because we got the World Cup in 2026. So everybody is crying left and right. Um, the waterworks are, are, are all over the place. So a lot of drama on and off the field. Something for everybody every single day. I am living the best Groundhog Day that you could ever live. Uh, we're just cranking out the content here from our beautiful set here, here at Red Square, and I, I wouldn't want to be any place else. It's so much fun here. I got to tell you, the, the Russian people, the Russian country, and then this tournament have been something to behold. You're always one of our favorites. Let's talk about one of the other favorites coming into this tournament, Spain. They play later on today on FS1. No, They only need a draw or a win to be able to advance. What would your assessment of their play be so far? Uh, look, they, played, they only played a couple of games, and they had that incredible, epic uh, encounter in the first game with uh, Portugal slash Cristiano, who scored the three goals. Uh, and there's no shame in that. But, but Spain is a slow burn, and I still love this Spain team. I think that they are going to go far. Uh, keep in mind that when Spain won the World Cup, a couple World Cups go in 2010, they started off the tournament actually losing their first game. So a, a, a bad performance or a loss is not the end of the world. And as we know in a tournament, it's not what you're doing at the beginning, it's what you're doing at the end. And your ability to get better and better as the tournament goes on is crucial. And I think Spain from game one to game two uh, got better. And it's not as if they're scoring a lot of goals, but I just think the quality that they have, the depth that they have, and I think the history and the understanding and the collective understanding and the identity of who they are is going to take them far. All right, Alexi, let's talk about Messi because this is, listen, I'm not, I'm not the expert like you are, but some of the commentary surrounding him, at least on the internet, 
has infuriated me. This guy is leading all of Europe in goals. I think he's leading all of Europe in assists, in goals created. I'm pretty sure the last time I watched a World Cup final, Argentina was playing in it into extra time in which they lost to Germany. Yet because he hasn't played well and Argentina hasn't played well through two games of this World Cup, Everyone's like, ah, oh, see, Ronaldo's better than him. Messi stinks. He chokes on the world stage again. What is a fair assessment on how Messi has played, given that Argentina has not played the way we would have hoped? A fair assessment is that Messi has not played well yet in this World Cup. And also, also part of that fair assessment is that Argentina as a team, and certainly that supporting cast, has also not played well. And this is the, the interesting balance that we're doing here in this inevitable compare and contrast, because oftentimes we based our perception on Messi with what he does for his club team, which is Barcelona, one of the best teams, uh, not just the best teams in the, in the world now, but one of the best teams overall. They fundamentally have changed the way that we view and play the game. Uh, and, you know, and you guys talk about you know, LeBron, for example. And I, I don't know what the worst team or just what a... a a lesser team is in the NBA, but if you took LeBron and you put him onto a lesser team, all right, he's not going to be the same. It's just you, you, you can do only so much as an individual. However, when it comes to Messi or LeBron in this case, there's still a level that you have to hit and that your individual ability can bring you to. And I don't think that we have seen that. So is it fair to put it all on Messi? Look. Soccer isn't fair and life isn't fair. All right, get used to it. You are messy, all right? You, you are an international superstar. You are one of the greatest players ever to play the game. And, by the way, in this inevitable compare and contrast between Messi and Ronaldo, I would submit to you that Messi has more talent around him playing for Argentina than Cristiano Ronaldo has talent around him playing for Portugal. And that is important because what... Cristiano Ronaldo has done and said, all right, I recognize that I don't have as much talent as when I'm playing at Real Madrid, but I'm willing to take this team on my shoulder. I get it that not everybody's as good around me, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to find a way to, to contribute. I'm going to find a way to play to a level, not necessarily the level when I'm at Real Madrid. And Messi hasn't done that. And, you know, like the body language doesn't help. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little wary of screaming and yelling at, at, at people, you know, because of the optics of, you know, they're, they're shrugging or they're crying or something like that. But it has not looked good. He looks like he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. But the soccer gods work in mysterious ways. And it would not surprise me in the least if Argentina goes through to the round of 16, puts this entire group phase behind them, and then kicks on. Alexi, your emotions are nothing compared to CC, which is why I need to ask this question. I am not entirely sure that he doesn't have his jersey, his personalized Senegal jersey underneath his suit. They are tied for the lead in Group I H. I got a workout in it yesterday. I had to rest. Think it. very carefully before you answer this question. Do you see them advancing to the knockout stage? This will I do. I think that this is a show. very uh, intelligent team. I, I think that this is a, uh, an incredibly good-looking team. You mentioned CeCe. God, good what a good-looking guy. <laughs> and, and just a wonderful player, a wonderful coach. I think that he's got the attention of the world right now. But more importantly, I think he's got a great team that he is working with. And what, th this phenomenon that we see sometimes is we have teams that do really well qualifying for the World Cup. And then they get to the World Cup, and they smash into reality. Better teams, better defense, people, teams that have scouted you, that shut down whatever the focus is on your team. This is, the, this is the opposite case. This is a team that has not lost a game since, what, 2015 in terms of a competitive game. They come cruising into the World Cup. Everybody thinks, all right, they're going hit, to hit, hit reality. No, they didn't mess around. They went right through. I do think that this is, uh, this is a team that has a chance not just to get to the round of 16, but to pose some real problems. And, and they are feeling it. And they're a team that you want to be a part of. This is, this, is a team, this is a team that you want to dance with, that you want to sing with, that you want to party with. And this is a team that you want to watch when they are on the field. That's awesome. That's yep. awesome. Alexi, excellent answer. <laughs> He's so happy. He's speechless. Oh, this is great. It, this guy's walking around Tribeca <laughs> yesterday in a Senegal jersey with 80 and Carter on the back of it, as if he's not recognizable <laughs> enough, just rooting on these guys. And some guy had enough nerve to ask me who you with. Who I'm with? What do you mean who I'm with? <laughs> Senegal. <laughs> I'm ready. Appreciate that. We so appreciate you. Whatever you got there in Moscow, send it back to us. Thank uh, you, Alexi. We will be watching it's you right beautiful. after it's a we beautiful finish thing. up here on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First, and we are going viral. Check out CeCe's son, Deron Carter, with a pick six in the CFL. CeCe, break this down for us. Oh, this is a big game for him. See, um, 
game number two for them this season. Also, his second game, he started a defensive back. He started a game last season. We knew this year he would play both ways. He had an injury. He started at corner the whole game. Did have this pick six early in the game. Now, he did give up a big play later in the game. I just call it chalk it up as inexperienced, but tremendous play for a guy who's been a wide receiver his whole life, now playing both ways in the CFL. All right, so he's played less than a half dozen games as a corner in the CFL, if I'm yes. correct. He has two career interceptions, correct? Yes. How many career interceptions returned for touchdowns? Both of them. Two. Both of them. Yes. So both times he's picked off the ball, he's gone back and scored. Learning a new position. Bigger than your typical corner. He's bigger than you are. People. Oh, people no, he's 6'5", 6'4 and a half. He's a big guy playing corner who was... I, I'm not going to act like I'm some CFL expert, but since Chris Carter's come in my life, I've started to follow yeah. his son. Yeah. He was leading the CFL in receiving touchdowns around the time last year that they started playing him at corner, and now he's doing great. It's really cool to see. Yeah, he's definitely one of the top three wide receivers up there. He'll always say he's number one, but <laughs> he got that from his mama. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Time for some stories to start your morning. Markel Fultz struggled in his rookie season, to say the least, and his trainer confirmed he had the yips. The yips? Yes, yeah, see, are you optimistic that Fultz can overcome this? This is what I'm worried about. It's the offseason. I see him making videos. He's making all kind of dunks and stuff, Sarah. He ain't shot that jump shot, Sarah. Now, I know if he had a jump shot like yours, we'd have some video of it. We've had video evidence knocking down threes. I'm done with the yips. I'm knocking it down. That's what happens when you get the yips putting. You see people making putts. Until I start to see that jump shot go down, I'm concerned. I, I think you have to be concerned. But if I had to bet right now, will this get fixed or will it not? I would bet on it getting fixed purely because I've never seen this in sports history. A basketball player forget how to shoot because that's what happened. I know it started with an injury, but his trainer now confirms what we all thought, which is it went from an injury of his shoulder to something with his brain. He's too talented mm -hmm. to have this continue to bedevil. Yes. To the NFL, Drew Brees is less than 1,500 yards away from Peyton Manning's record for career passing yards. And Peyton says Brees deserves the all-time record. CC, what does the all-time passing record mean for Drew Brees' legacy? Oh, it puts him in the rare, rare atmosphere that not only was he a thrower of the football in an exceptional level, but also look at the era for which he's getting these records. He's taking a record from Peyton Manning, who Peyton Manning took from another great player. Aaron Rodgers might be the most talented thrower, but when you have the yardage mark, it lets you know. I might not have the most talent, but I was the most accomplished passer of the football, and that's the class that Drew Brees would be in. And it continues, uh, I think, a favorable comparison for Brees to the guy historically he reminds people most of, which is Dan Fouts. A guy that the a guy that was just an unbelievable pure passer That's of the a great football, comparison. who was a super high yardage guy back before you saw these types of numbers. And Breeze is never going to come close to catching Brady in championships. He might not win another championship, but he is the best volume passer I've seen. And it speaks to shorter guys can play the quarterback position in the NFL. Absolutely. Julian Edelman will begin his appeal of his four-game suspension for performance-enhancing drugs. According to reports, Edelman's defense says the NFL mishandled his test sample. CeCe, what does this mean for the Patriots? Man, I've heard every excuse, uh, everyone for the drugs. I even came up with a few of them myself. It wasn't mine. I mean, it wasn't mine. Like, somebody handled that stuff wrong. Those people got stuff after me. Like, yeah. I Roll mean, down the window, please, yeah. Mr. Carter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see, this is hard for any team when you lose your number one slot receiver, but no one adapts better than New England. They won last year without him. They won the season before without Gronk. This is what they do. They have won with everyone that's left that roster, it, it, even Tom Brady. Can he can he use the I was just in a car where people were doing it excuse, or is that not working? No, for those kind of drugs don't get into your system. <laughs> okay. this right, yeah, someone, right, so yeah, someone either gave him a tablet he, or a shot. You can't get a contact high? <laughs> I mean, no. I don't know what he's going to say. I, I guess the NFL mishandled it your best defense if you can't say, no, nah, my partner was smoking. I wasn't smoking. Listen. They, well, typically, someone from the team is collecting your sample. Oh, okay. Well, so that doesn't work so great either. All right, listen. The, to your point, yes, the Pats will be fine because they're always fine. I mean, they haven't played a game with Gronk and Edelman in how long? Like, they're, to, uh, at the same time, they'll be fine. I heard that New England was going to tell them that the samples were deflated. <laughs>
<laughs> that a loop? Oh, that didn't work. No, it didn't work. Oh. Finally, Odell Beckham has been participating in the Giants' off-season program so far, but according to reports, he could hold out of training camp as he looks for a new contract. CC, what do you make of Odell's situation? It's going to be a tough one because if I'm the Giants, I got to play by the rules that were presented to me, and that's the collective bargaining agreement. And I don't believe this is going to work out well for Odell. I'm all for guys getting paid, but to pay a wide receiver 18 to 20 million dollars a year over a five-year period, I just think that's going to be tough for the Giants to do. So I don't look for the Giants to extend them, and I look for the Giants mm. ultimately to franchise them because. That's what this system with the collective bargaining. If you're a great player and you come into this league and you are a, a, a first round pick, they have the fifth year option on you so that you're stuck with them for five years. That's where he's approaching that fifth year. Now, you could franchise him for two additional years without him being free agent. So if you look at being able to get the value for him without putting out the upfront money, up money, if you have concerns and the guarantees, that's the way to do it. And I believe Odell will run into that with the Giants. Listen, if, if that is what the Giants plan to do, if they plan to not give him a contract this offseason, and also potentially next offseason, which is what you're talking about, because they wouldn't be franchising him now. It'd be a year from now. Then Odell be a damn fool if he doesn't hold out. Listen, this I was I was there for the wasn't there for the negotiations. I was there for the the work stoppage that almost cost us games. And what we were told was this: with the new rookie salary structure, the money is going to go from unproven rookies to proven guys to guys who have earned it. Odell had the most productive first 47 games of a career of any receiver in NFL history. If he hasn't earned it. Nobody has. And if, if, if the precedent gets set that even guys that way overachieve in their rookie deals, they're not getting extended before the fifth-year option. They might not get extended after the fifth year. Then, it's, then when are guys going to get paid? What's the average career in the NFL? Well, 3.5 3. years has been for over th almost 30 years. And you're talking about being able to not pay a guy for seven years. So for twice the length of the average career, You've got to get past before you can get another contract. Hell no, man. And this is the thing. This is the deal that they signed. Yep. All right? The players, all right, they signed this contract that the owners could potentially. If you're a great player, you wouldn't be a free agent for your first seven years in the league, twice, twice the lifespan of players that have made it over the last 30 years. But two things with that. That is the deal they signed. But there was part of the selling of the deal was we want to take care of guys who have earned it. Right. Odell checks that box. But the other part of this, the owners also signed a deal that still allows players to hold out. Now, it's punitive. It's $30,000 a day come training camp. But Odell's got that Nike money. He can, find, he, 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 he can hold out better than most players can. It is important. This is the union side of me coming out now. It is important for the rare players with leverage to exert that leverage. Because most guys do not have that leverage. The quarterbacks almost never exert the leverage, even though they're the ones with the most of it. If the Giants will give Odell his deal and he stays out of trouble, then if I were him, I, I would 100% hold out. I like when the union side comes out. All right, guys, it's time, <laughs> time for in or out. Last week, the Mavericks made a draft day deal to get Real Madrid superstar Luka Doncic. The 19-year-old was the youngest MVP ever in the EuroLeague, widely considered the second-best league in the world. So, CC, are you in or out on Doncic being the best player in the draft? Well, this is uh, I'm in on him being a player. I believe he's going to be good, but being the best player in the draft? I'm going to take the money on the rest of the draft. I'm not going to give you one player, but you gave me the rest of the draft. I mean, we've seen last year Donovan Mitchell, man, mm -hmm. slide in the first round, and they pick him up in Utah. We have seen this happen through the years. We've talked a lot about Kawhi. Now, Kawhi was a mid-first round, so, no, I'm going with the, I'm out. I'm in him as a player, but I'm out him being I, the I best I get what of the you're draft. saying. It's very hard to say this one guy versus the field unless the guy was the consensus, no doubt, number one overall pick. Unless it's LeBron, Anthony Davis. like, mm -hmm. And even sometimes in those cases, those guys don't end up being the best player in their draft. But I'm in on this. I have never seen a prospect that is proven more at a younger age than Luka Doncic. I want to make sure people understand this. Youngest EuroLeague MVP ever. Led his team to a championship in the EuroLeague. The best player on Real Madrid was supposed to be Sergio Yol, a guy the Rockets drafted years ago. He hasn't come over. He got hurt. Doncic at 19 against grown men 
dominated in that league. I'd rather have him than Aiton. I'd rather have him in the field. I think the Mavericks did be great. I think he is the sec the best yeah. player in this I draft. think it's a good spot for him with the Mavs. So. I can't wait to see him playing next to Dennis Smith Jr. All right, sticking with the other side, these two forever linked, the Hawks ended up with a number five overall pick, Trey Young. There had been a lot of speculation that Young might slip in the draft after struggling in the second half of last season with Oklahoma. Nick, are you in or out on Trey Young being worth a top five pick? I am in on it for this reason. Top five pick, I want superstar potential. And it, while his bust potential to me is higher than a guy like Wendell Carter, it's higher than a guy like Colin Sexton, his chance of being an all-NBA caliber player is higher as well. If I, I wouldn't have traded him for Doncic, but that's just because of how much I like Doncic. If you're Atlanta... I, I like the player. I like the fit. I'm in on this. I got to be out. When, when you see there's not a model, like if, if Steph Curry was being drafted, would we draft him in the top five? Well, yeah, after seeing him, we would, but we wouldn't have drafted him with that body type and that style of game. It's not a game that is transferred to the NBA very, very well. Now, is he going to be the one special guy to be able to do it? I'm going to be out. I'm going to observe this because I'm just into big. Big people, <laughs> when you can play in the sports, big. Big is better. You got a bias against little guys. It might be a fair bias, but it's a bias. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not touching that. Hype. I'm not touching that. No, On to OKC, where Carmelo Anthony officially picked yeah, up big. his option for next season, <laughs> which will pay him just under $28 million. Last year, Melo averaged the fewest points in his illustrious NBA career. So, CeCe, are you in or out? on Melo having a bounce back season. Man, I've been they've been asking me this question on TV for like three years. And I've been out. <laughs> y'all y'all asked me again. Now the Syracuse guy, he's a smart guy. Well not that guy, but oh whoa, whoa. Melo. Because you know he opts into the contract, of course, but no bounce back. Where's he gonna bounce back from? He got us last year on the hoodie Melo. Oh I'm in shape wearing those three X hoodies. And then once we saw him as the season started, he just started expanding back back out into real Melo. So no I'm out on a bounce back. I'm in on a bounce back. Now, you will not bounce back to all-star form. You stop doing oh, this. Hold on. Wait a second. Let me ex I bet I can sway you. Give me six. Give me uh, just a minute here. 30 seconds. All right. He was the least efficient offensive player in the league last year. The least of guys that took at least 15 shots. He was the worst. So, you know, you, I like this. Can't get worse from there, right? Only can go up. And let me add this. I don't think he's going to be on the Thunder. I think he's going to be playing wherever LeBron's playing. I think he's going to take a buyout with OKC. I think he's going to go to a better team. I think he's going to know his role better. And we will say, oh, look at look at Melo coming off the bench, giving you 14 points a game, a little more efficient. That would be considered a bounce back year. I'm in on that. Just Does he lose OKC. the hoodie? Hey, you can't fool me two seasons in a row. I mean, I don't care what he does this offseason. He can run around like a like a boxer with a bag on him. <laughs> Moving on, the Cavs reportedly attempting to trade for Hornets all-star point guard Kemba Walker with the hope that it will entice LeBron James to stick around. CC in or out on Kemba impacting LeBron's free agency decision. I'm in. You know the reason why? Because Kemba is a version of Kyrie Irving. Hey, LeBron, go stand in the corner. I got a guy who can get you major, major buckets. No, no pick and roll. He can go off the dribble. He can go off the bounce. I mean, he can intermediate. He's got a three-point game. Just what LeBron wants to be able to extend the court? Yes, absolutely. Wish they would have traded for him last year when they wanted him. Listen, I'm in as well. I, I've been swayed on this from talking to people that I was told I should not slam the door on LeBron staying in Cleveland. I wasn't told it's likely, but I was told that I was wrong if I went on TV and said there's no chance he stays. You add Kimba Walker, he starts looking around and saying, man, play a year with Kimba, make this decision a year from now. I think that would be a move yeah. that would make it more likely he stays in Cleveland for at least one more year. I like it. Last time, uh, we're going to be talking about Tim Tebow here, Steve Spurrier, the head coach of the Orlando team and the newly formed Alliance of American Football League, says he reached out to Tebow for playing, about playing for him. Tebow informed the old ball coach that he will stick to playing baseball. Nick, are you in or out on Tebow's decision to stick with baseball? Oh, listen, if he wants to play at the highest level professionally, baseball is the only sport he can do it. So I'm in on that. I think good for Tim Tebow to continue to play baseball, but see, I mean, I'll, I'll cede the floor to you on this one, my friend. Sarah, if throwing the football is involved in any type of sport, <laughs> Tim Tebow shouldn't be trying to play that sport because if throwing the football inaccurately is important, 
as I said on TV, <laughs> when Tim Tebow was playing in the NFL, that he wouldn't be playing? No, no, no. He baseball, I believe he's going to be called up by the Mets at, the end, of, at, by the, end of, at the end of this season. Wow. They're going to call him up? Yes, absolutely. Stay on TV, Tebow. Stay at the uh, minor league baseball till they call you up. Don't fool with that trying to throw the football straight and accurate again. <laughs> All right? That's the only thing in his life he hadn't been able to do. And you're right. You are you're right. right. I mean, he stayed away from women and everything. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> Coming up. I mean, Let's get the break. Can we get the break? I mean, yeah. he got a heck of a story. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I mean, he's a child. You, you got to read Frank, Could the 76ers sign LeBron James? Come on, you hear me. Come on, you hear me. Come on, come on. No, sir. That's the next time. Chris Broussard is back with us. Don't talk about his hair. You look no. great, Chris. Well, While the two thank favorites you. to sign LeBron James seem to be Cleveland or L.A., Philadelphia attempting to enter the LeBron James sweepstakes. 76ers reportedly doing everything they can to clear cap space for James to sign there. LeBron has until Friday to sign or decline his player option for next year. Chris, how realistic is LeBron signing with the 76ers? Well, I do think the Lakers are the favorite and then Cleveland second. Um, I think Philadelphia would be third. And I think because, as you, you were saying earlier, I think th there's two main factors in his decision. One is the ability to compete and try to win championships. And two is his family. You know, his son's about to go into the eighth grade. So I think he wants his next move to be somewhere they can settle throughout high school for his kids or at least his oldest kid. And somewhere they probably have some type of roots. In L.A., they have, you know, they've lived there in the summers. They have houses there. So they have roots there. Uh, Philadelphia, I don't want to rule them out completely, but I just think it's going to be an uphill climb for them because he, he has no roots there. I know there were reports, and I was told that he did have representatives go visit mm -hmm. Philadelphia High School. Mm -hmm. So a few months back, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I would love to see it basketball-wise. Well, well, see, that's the thing. I, I can't speak to the family stuff for LeBron, and that is very important for anyone that's married with kids. I, I get it. But for everything that is not that doesn't have anything to do with the family, Philly is the best place, basketball-wise. I am so sick of people saying it's a bad fit. Oh, they don't have enough shooting. They, they, they're going to have more shooting than Cleveland did. I know that. Cleveland which had the worst backcourt play in the NBA this sure. year. Like, yeah. They're going to have better shooting than Cleveland did, and LeBron is certainly better shooting than Cleveland did in the postseason when LeBron averaged 34-9-9 and and took that team to the finals. So basketball-wise, the defense would be monstrous. The pick and roll with him and Embiid, or the pick and roll with him and Simmons, or the pick and roll with Simmons and him, like depending on how you want to do it, would be so hard to guard. How about legacy-wise? You want to take a third team to the finals. You want to maybe make 10 consecutive NBA finals, tying Bill Russell's record. Maybe you could go even more than that. You, uh, you I could, mean, really. You, yeah. Absolutely. Because I see it as he could carry them potentially I, to championships while he's still the best player. Well, in the world. that was the third. He could do the Miami yeah. thing. Well, well, four but, straight. Well, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the, the other, th so basketball wise, Lexi wise, and how about longevity? Yep. When he gets there, he's the best player and beats the second best, Simmons third best. In a few years, maybe Embiid's the best. And a few years after that, LeBron could be the third best player on a team, If speaking of family, if he really is trying to hold on long enough to see if there's a chance that his Play son, who's son. in eighth grade, could make the league while he's still there. For all those reasons, Philly's the best fit, aside from the family. I think the, the fact that we know, and, and knowing people close to the situation, that there is no perfect fit. There are people that want him in the inner circle to play for the Lakers. But it's, it's not yeah. perfect. If you look at all the other trade options, they're not perfect. Philadelphia, not only from a basketball standpoint, from a location standpoint. LeBron, if he wanted his family, because I know there's a strong pull on him to stay in Ohio, it'd be easy for him to set up some type of situation, living situation in Philadelphia and still be able to yeah. see the family and have the family in Cleveland. So them being the closest from a location standpoint, you have to consider that it's the best basketball fit because it's just like when we start looking for places in New York. As a matter of fact, you have a wish list, but that wish list going to get cut down to what's your priority? Do you want some closet space? You want to be close to the highway, close to the subway system, close to restaurants and things like that? So LeBron is going to have to make some type of compromises, and I believe those compromises can be made in, in Philadelphia. That's a great point, and it, what you meant about it's close enough to Ohio where you could do that. And I do think basketball-wise, this is even better than 
if he and Kawhi or he and Paul George went to the Lakers. I agree. That would be good, too. Yes. Don't get me wrong, but that's in the West. In the East, it'd be so much easier. And as you said, in the GOAT arguments down the line, even if he doesn't win six, if he can say he went to 11 straight or 12 and what overall if he went in finals, finals with five in different coaches? Years. He's already been in the finals with four coaches. He, what if mm-hmm. goes to the finals with five coaches, three franchises, wins wins at least one ring with three franchises? Like that is now we're talking. He's looking five coaches. He's, look, he's looking for you know he's ammunition. What? For no, no, yeah, no, he's no, trying, no. He's trying to build the tail of the tape. And he wore it, three back. different types of sneakers oh, no. in the finals. <laughs> what, what do you think this year showed him? I mean, the fact that in his 15th season he was exceptional. The amount of minutes he played, playing all 82 games. Do you think? That has made him believe that I can still continue to carry a team, that he still wants to mentor some younger guys like the 76. Or do you think he's like, okay, I did that and I need some other veterans or a little bit more help? I think LeBron wants to play with some younger, talented players. I think also because he mentioned us in the press conference how smart Golden State is, how they play basketball. I believe that part LeBron would like to play, but also some younger player. He's played with old teams. In Miami, people forget, even though at that time, him and Dwayne Wade and them, they weren't. Dwayne started breaking down, and they added older pieces. Since he's been in Cleveland, they've been one of the oldest teams in basketball since he's been there. I just think the fact that Philly will have a pull on him because of a lot of the other things we talked about, but in no other place is there a Joel Embiid. Yep. Is there no other place like Kobe where you can throw the ball into the post and say, big man, Go to work. And I believe that old-fashioned type of basketball will have a pool on LeBron because, man, you get to those playoff situations and you got a guy that you can go into the paint. There is no one in the NBA who has someone like that. Yep. So I believe those things will have a pool on LeBron also. And, they, I mean, I, when, if I look at LeBron in that lineup, now I don't know if they could beat Golden State or not. But I think there's a formula there because of Embiid. How in the world are you going to go small – Against Embiid, he would destroy and, Draymond Green and against in their length. And that's the thing is, like, it's, yeah, because Simmons, Simmons, LeBron, is Sarich, Sarich right. is six ten. Like this Coming is where, six, now eight. we're gonna get back to your big people argument. They're ginormous. Like, yes. They're like the German they would World be Cup huge. team. And, and yes. have some good shooting. And, and, so, and so, so how can you beat Golden State, right? If we if we just want to do the championships thing, right? How can you beat Golden State? Where do you have to take advantage? How about rebounding? Yep. Offensive yep. rebounding. Mm-hmm. When the Cavs won the title in 2016, yep. that's what made Tristan Thompson so valuable. Man, when you when LeBron of your big three guys is the littlest guy, like of your yeah. best three players, and what about a top five defense? And so oh, the win. defense would be swarming. I mean, we know last year Philadelphia, they're a top three defense yep. without, without LeBron. Him. And yes. I, I gotta say this, and and I like Zaire Smith, but Bridges, Mikael Bridges was a shooter. You know, 43% from three. Zaire Smith's more of an athlete. I know, I believe that their intention is to have him try to be like a Jalen Brown where you can teach him to shoot and he's got everything else. But that trade, that was a little bizarre to me because I just thought Bridges, they need shooting. If they can't bring back Reddick, they're going to need some more shooting. Bridges' mother also thought that it was a bizarre <laughs> That was <situation>. heartbreaking. <laughs> that was heartbreaking. One of the most special moments turned upside down. Chris, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. it. All right, how far can Dak Prescott take the Cowboys short, next season? We're going to talk about that next. Short, oh, yeah, it's got a and we're going to get back to the NFL. The Cowboys have faced a tough offseason, cutting Des Bryant, losing Jason Witten to retirement. However, Dak Prescott still has high hopes for Dallas this season. The third-year QB said he is doing his absolute best to take the Cowboys to the Super Bowl. Coach, which area does Dak need to improve on the most for the Cowboys to be at their best? Well, looking at his first season versus second season, interceptions was was an issue. There were, I think, nine more interceptions in the second year than there was in the first year. His completion percentage went down by about 5%, mm-hmm. and then he was sacked more. He was trying to hold the ball more and make things happen. Now, this this di- the dynamic of this offense has changed dramatically. They've, they've paid the offensive line. They've got three number one draft picks. Another guy who could have been a number one draft pick, they just picked up mm-hmm. a second-round draft pick. All those guys are in the top ten in terms of what they're being paid. There's a, there's a big responsibility there, and then the running game is going to have to be what they hope it should be with a full year of Ezekiel Elliott. But for him, he's going to have to do a better job of processing what defenses give him, make quick decisions, 
be efficient because they don't have the explosive weapons on the outside. Well, it's listen, the best quarterbacks in the league make explosive plays and take care of the football. The, tier, the you know, the Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, we've seen the years where they've had less than 10 interceptions, more than 30 touchdowns. But all right, so let's go just one tier down from there, right? You got to do one of those two things at a very high level. Dak's rookie year, he was extraordinary at taking care of the football. Didn't make a ton of big plays, but didn't have to. They had the running game, defense played well, and he wasn't giving the other team extra possessions, so you were just almost win winning a war of attrition each, w each week. Last year, he did neither great. So in year three, either he needs to get back to the ball security he had in year one, or 13 interceptions isn't terrible if it's paired with explosive plays. Or he needs to make more of those big chunk plays down the field that third and eight turns into a big play and all of a sudden your drive's still going. Like, he's got to do one of those two things. Either get back to taking care of the football at an elite level or start making plays at an elite level, which he hasn't done in his career yet. When you're not familiar with the tight end, which they're going to have a new one, when you don't have a number one wide receiver, it becomes very, very important in year number three. Because the NFL has got two books on you. Your rookie year, which you played one way, and then they have the book that they have last year, which was very, very successful. So he was not very good when you took away his number one target. So he was going to number two and three. He was not very good. So I expect him to be better in year number three in doing that. And right now, between the OTA's mini camps and training camp, he's got to identify the talent of his wide receivers. Know your personnel. It becomes very important that a quarterback knows what a guy can do, but also more important that he knows what guys can't do. He's got to develop Alan Hearns, the guy who they got as a wide receiver. He's had 1,000-yard season in his career. He's got to develop him as his number one target. He's the most explosive and the most seasoned of all the wide receivers and most talented wide receiver. He's got to develop Ezekiel Elliott as a dynamic pass catcher out of the backfield. He's got to, dy um, he's got to develop Cole Beasley as one of the top 10 slot receivers. If he doesn't do those things, forget about turning over the football. If he doesn't identify the personnel that he has and be a force multiplier with those guys, Dallas, they're just, they're just a one dimensional offense dominated by their offensive line and the all pro running back that they have in Zeke and, and my biggest concern is if Dallas can play the game the way that they would like to where they run the ball it's play action, on their terms on their terms I think they're going to be very good I, th I think they're going to win a lot of games it's when they get in those situations where they have to throw the ball everybody in the stadium knows they have to throw the ball and then it's a function of can those wide receivers get open and can he make the right reads and and that's that's where we're going to have to figure out how good this Dallas team can be. As long as they can do it the way they want to, they'll be, they'll be in the mix every single game. It's when that changes what's going to happen. Well, we're talking a lot about Dak. How much of this is on Jason Garrett to, to make sure that Dak is in the position to succeed and in decisions that he's making with those guys around them? There, there's tremendous pressure. When you oh, fire yeah. as many people as they've fired over the last year, whether it's the old line coach or the wide receiver coach, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a litany of guys that, that have left. You're saying that, that they were part of the problem. So now you've brought in another group of guys. You, you've, you've put together the core that you, you want. You've been there a long time. He's, he's got a lot of pressure to make this work. And also some things, I, I heard Cole Beasley, a quote that he said, it's the first time someone's taught him how to run routes. Now, that's a criminal indictment against the staff that was there before. And one of the reasons why Des Bryant didn't develop or take that step or able to stay in his prime longer because his lack of route running. So a lot of pressure it's going to be put on. <laughs> okay, there you go. No, so. I'm just saying, when a guy says that's the first time what? I ever learned, to me, it's like, all right, Cole, settle down. I'm sure you were taught how to run routes. He's and trying then, to be a little harder this offseason, Coach. He cut a little album and everything. I, I, he I, said I, he's tired of stereotypes, I'm, too. I'm down with Short the album. Area quickness. <laughs> Look, I've dropped a few albums in my day, but I'm not going to drop a bunch of excuses as to why I can't get open. You've been taught how to run routes between high school, college, the professional coaches that you've had. Like, step up, be accountable for your performance, and don't don't throw that in some guy that, that's left. When you mentioned be accountable for your performance, the Cowboys, we, we banged on Dez about this a lot, but it was a team-wide issue. It's been a team-wide issue. Yards after the catch. How much of that is a wide receiver stat, and how much of that's a quarterback stat? 
Because Chris talks about the best quarterbacks in the world throw a ball that speaks to you. That, that when the ball is out in front of you, you know it's because it's supposed to be. Because that means you have open space. When you see a team where almost everybody struggles in yards after catch, I think we say, oh, well, Witten's real slow. Beasley's not great. But how much of that can da- how much can Dak help their yards after catch? Qu- quarterbacks can help that tremendously. And you see that a lot on slants, check downs, mm-hmm. crossing routes. It's where the ball's placed. If the ball's placed out in front of them, the guy can catch it and go. And the Cowboys used to be good at that. That's really, what Des really Bryant did. That. But then when you're when the receiver has to work, when the receiver has to come behind for the ball and then bring it in and then start to run, it, it's difficult. And, and you can really identify that on those shorter routes as to whether or not the quarterback's making the receivers work or whether he's giving them a chance to catch it and go. Right. There's a difference between a catchable ball, Nick, and a ball that's going to help me get more yards right. after the catch. But, Coach, I like how you open up your hips and everything. Because oh, yeah. I, like I had a lot of quarterbacks who put the ball back here. I did demo they that. Couldn't, they couldn't time up your speed? No, no. Well, I'm talking about the guys who were throwing for me on my team. We, had a lot of, we didn't have a lot of catching them, unfortunately. Coach, Dak is talking about oh, the Super Bowl. I thought she was saying Not goodbye. Yet. No, stay, no, stay. No, my bad. I did the free <laughs> handshake. A little Good, too I'm early. Excited. No, my Dak bad. Dak is talking about the Super Bowl, but when you look at the Cowboys where do they even stack up right now in your perspective in the division well again this model is is a little bit different than what we've seen where that investment in the offensive line it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out they have so many resources in there between draft picks money they they need to be able to to take over games and if they can do that and you can dominate in the running game and and again play the game on on the Cowboys terms they should be in the mix throughout the course of the season. And we haven't quite seen this model in a salary capped NFL. I know we had mm-hmm. the Hogs in Washington. Yes. I know the Dallas Dynasty in the early 90s had some great offensive linemen, Larry Allen, Nate Newton, among some others. But in a league with, a, with this salary cap structure, having the highest paid tackle, the highest paid center, on the highest paid guard, we haven't seen another team trot that out there as their formula to getting to the Super Bowl. What that does mean is the Cowboys have to be the best in the league at third and short, right? That they've got to, they, they, That's how you can earn that money. Mm-hmm. Where it comes to Dak is the time Zeke gets stuffed on first and second, and you're in third and nine, which shouldn't be often, but it's going to happen. How, how good is he in those situations where he has to pick up the team to keep a drive going? Well, that, that's what I was saying to Chris earlier is, when the whole stadium knows you have to throw yep. the ball. You know you have to throw it. The defense knows you have to throw it. The whole world knows you have to throw it. Can he go back there? Can those guys get open? And that's a real test of, of, of his ability to, to process what's happening, get the ball in the right place, give the receivers a chance. But what are those receivers going to do? You know, what, and, and what are they going to do offensively to help those guys if they can't get open, whether it's formations or or route combinations, that's going to be interesting to see, too. I think a great comparison this year in year number three for Dak would be, let's compare him to the quarterbacks in the NFC East. Is he better than Alex Smith? Is he better than Eli Manning? Because if he's not better than those two, because I know he's not as good as Carson Wentz is in Philadelphia, but if he's not as good as those two, they don't have a chance this year to get to the